Jacob Needleman's Lost Christianity. Chapter 1, The Introduction The Old Religions The impulse to write this book first arose a number of years ago when I was interviewing Christian and Jewish clergymen about the challenge of the new religions. At that time, the turning toward the teachings of the East had just begun and was still limited mainly to the young. There was obviously a religious awakening beginning in America, and just as obviously, it was leading many people not toward but away from the established spiritual institutions of the West. I wanted to know what Christians and Jews were thinking about this and how they were going to respond. Meeting with bishops, priests, ministers, and rabbis across America and in Europe, I soon became aware that a great deal of soul-searching was going on, and not only in reaction to the unconventional religiosity of the young. I began to suspect that the new religions were not the only sign that a new life was being breathed into the dying spiritual practices of our culture. I wondered, was there perhaps a secret fermentation going on as well within the seeming confusion of the old religions? Certainly, the hunger of those who wished to remain within the fold of Christianity was often as intense as sometimes even more so than the motivation of many people turning to the religions of the Orient. In fact, of all the experiences I had while researching the material for my book on the new religions, none has remained more firmly in my memory than my meeting with a certain bishop. We had been talking for several hours about the attractions of Eastern religions. Toward the end of the interview, coffee and sandwiches were brought in, and I had put away my notebook. Conversation became informal and unguarded. I mentioned to him that in my own academic work as a professor of philosophy and religion, I had begun to perceive things in the Bible that I never dreamed were there. I was beginning to understand that everything I had seen in the Eastern teachings was also contained in Judaism and Christianity, although the language of the Bible was practically impossible to penetrate because it had become so encrusted with familiar associations. At that, he quickly nodded in agreement with a sort of knowingness that somehow made me uncomfortable. For the next few minutes, I couldn't believe I was speaking with the same man. Gone was the relaxed, genial conversationalist. Even his voice suddenly lost its resonance. He spoke nervously of the efforts he was making to bring contemplative methods into the life of his diocese. He was working closely with several well-known humanistic psychologists and had himself studied Zen meditation with this aim in mind. Everything he said seemed completely lacking in conviction. He was constantly scanning my face for some sign of approval, and this eventually made me so ill at ease that I blurted out in a half-joking way, Well, I've always imagined that you leaders of the church have a secret monastery someplace where you go to refresh your inner lives under the direction of a wise spiritual guide. I was quite startled by his reaction. He leaned toward me over the top of his huge desk and said, without any pretense or sense of position, asking simply, where? Where is it? What are Christians looking for? The face of the bishop in that moment and the sound of his question came back to me time and again during the writing of The New Religions and long after its publication. Whenever I was invited to speak at conferences of Christians or Jews, I saw that face and heard that voice. To me, it had become the face of contemporary Western religion and the voice of its need. When time permitted, I began seeking out meetings with established religious leaders of every denomination, particularly where I had heard that efforts were being made to recover and recreate the inner spiritual content of the tradition. But invariably, I came away with a sense of frustration over my inability to understand what was going on. On the desk in front of me now, there are several thick notebooks detailing the interviews and conferences of the past seven years. 
Here's a meeting with a group of Protestant ministers seeking a return to primitive Christianity through charity and meditation. Here are the notes I made when visiting the ecumenical community of Taze, France, a community not bound to any one confession whose first vocation is passion for the unity of the body of Christ. And here is the program of an East-West conference I attended several years ago in New York, bringing together the one spirit uniting all the paths to God through the exchange of truth among Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims, breaking down the artificial barrier of culture, race, and nations. And here is my conversation with a Roman Catholic nun just returned from a community of Christian hermits in the Arizona desert working to bring back to Christianity the spirit of contemplative consciousness which the church has lost. And here is a talk with a group of Jewish students practicing Kabbalistic meditation under the guidance of a well-known rabbi. And here too is the record of a discussion led by a leader of the Hasidic community in New York which seeks to bring all Jews back into the tr traditional contemplative discipline of meditation on the Torah and obedience to the commandments of the Creator. However, the latest entry in these notebooks is dated over four years ago. Between then and now, there's nothing. Not that I was no longer meeting Western religious leaders who identified themselves with the spiritual revolution. On the contrary, such meetings were taking place more and more often and usually without my initiating them. It is only as I now realize that I had given up hope of understanding what Christians were looking for in their new religion. At the same time, it became increasingly clear to me that were Christianity actually to recover its own esoteric tradition, it would be a development of immense significance. In using this term esoteric, I mean to say that Christianity that works, that actually produces real change in human nature, real transformation. This word is far better than the word mysticism, which has come to be applied to only one kind of special experience. If there ever had been such a thing as a Christian or a Judaic esoteric tradition, it would have included what we ordinarily understand by mysticism, but only as one aspect of a total way of living and struggling with oneself. But was this what Christians were looking for? If so, if it were to be found, it would be an event that would make the phenomenon of the new religions pale and its insignificance by the comparison. At least so it has always seemed to me. In any case, I eventually came to the conclusion that there must be something very wrong in the way I was looking at the situation in contemporary Christianity and Judaism. Why did that bishop's question and his groping efforts touch me so deeply, more so than the searching of so many people who were turning to the East? Why did I become so impatient when listening to that rabbi lecturing on the meaning of the Kabbalah? and urging his young audience to meditate every day on the mystical name of God. Why was I so troubled by the nun I met, who spent hours each morning reading the sermons of the great Meister Eckhart, and who told me she was experiencing all the things he had written about? Why my gnawing irritation at an organization of Protestant members, ministers who were collecti collectively practicing Tibetan prostrations in order to bring back the sacralization of the human body, which they claimed was the original teaching of Christ. Why my sense of frustration after a long conversation with a Jesuit living in the Far East who, after many years of association with Taoists and Buddhists, tells me that we can use Buddhism to approach God, but only Christianity can take us inside God. Who was I to judge all this? I, who had only learned about Christianity through books and who only learned about Judaism by running away from it early in my life. People I knew would ask me, why are you so interested in Christianity? You're not a Christian, are you? A Christian monk. It was with a genuine sense of relief that I finally abandoned any plans of writing about the problems facing contemporary Christianity. 
The more I thought about it, the more I realized how subjective my own opinions were and how mixed with the contents of all the books I had read over a career of 15 years teaching courses in the history of Christian thought. It is true that I had many strong feelings about the message of Christianity, and through my studies and meetings with people, I had come to several ideas that struck me as important for my own understanding of the church's present situation. But all that only increased my sense of being an outsider with respect to the personal efforts of present-day Christians to rediscover the essence of the teaching. My decision and the reasons for it were strengthened by a chance meeting in December of 1975 with a man who spoke about Christianity in a way I had never encountered before, either in my academic work or in the numerous interviews I had conducted. This meeting took place while I was attending a conference in the Far East. Seated in the audience toward the rear was an interesting-looking older man, a Westerner, who from time to time put some pointed questions to the members of the panel. After the three-day conference, I happened to find myself standing next to him in line as I was waiting to board the plane from Bangkok to Hong Kong. He spoke English with a strong accent that I was never able to identify. As we approached the ticket counter, we heard an announcement of, that the flight would be delayed for about an hour, and so the two of us repaired to the airport dining room for a cup of coffee. There we passed the time pleasantly chatting. As we are, were about to return to the boarding area, an announcement informed us that due to engine problems, our flight would be delayed another hour. We both knew what that meant. Two, three, possibly four hours or more. We ordered more coffee and a meal and then began talking seriously. I was surprised to learn that this man was a Christian monk. I used the quotation marks not because I doubted him, but only because that was absolutely all I learned about his identity. There never seemed to be an appropriate moment when I could even ask his name, and when I tried to discover which order he belonged to, I was told only that it was situated in the Middle East and was quite old. Yet, strangely enough, I never had the impression of his being secretive, withholding anything from me. On the contrary, by the time our conversation had ended, after about three hours, I felt inundated, full of uh, overflowing power, with more ideas and information about the Christian tradition than I could possibly manage. I mean to say that not only was the amount of material he gave me overwhelming, but much more significant, the nature of his thinking was quite extraordinary. So much so that during the conversation and long afterward, I found myself revising almost everything I had ever thought about Christianity. Revising is not really the right word. It would be more accurate to say from this remarkable Christian monk, I heard things stated fully that up to that point I had only dimly imagined as pertaining to the Christian teaching. Much of what he said about the nature of Christian spiritual practice, interpretation of scripture, views on morality, mysticism, metaphysics, the soul, the place of the church, and so forth, was to say the least extremely unorthodox. At more than one place, I had the impulse to demand proofs, but he had activated something in me that was stronger than the scholar professor in my nature, and I feared that were I to turn the conversation into an argument, he would feel less free to speak his mind. But over and above all these considerations, there was something about the man himself that compelled me to listen rather than argue. It was a quality that I be am beginning to recognize as presence. I will say no more about this quality here except that among other things, it gave what he said the ring of authority. By the time we boarded the plane, I was craving to be alone with my notebook in order to write down some of the things he said. He traveled with me as far as Tokyo, and we parted with a warm embrace. It was only when the plane was back in the air that I kicked myself for not having tried to find out how to get in touch with him again. Later, I kicked myself even harder for not having gotten off the plane with him. 
off and on during the remainder of my flight back to America. I tried to record the conversation, but although I filled many pages in my notebook, I had the impression that I was distorting most of his ideas even as I was writing them down. I saw that he had spoken to a place in myself and that I was no longer in that place. My power of memory, which I usually wrote Guarded as a fairly well-developed instrument, was now pathetically inadequate. But what I did retain was something extremely important to me. Through meeting this unforgettable man, I realized that certainty, that there are worlds upon worlds of Christianity that neither I nor anyone else I had met knew anything about. In saying this, I am not referring to all the intricacies of Christian theology through the ages or to the million aspects of the history of Christendom among the nations of the world, nor am I referring to the kaleidoscope of ritual forms that make up the practices of the various denominations within the tradition. I understand that all the above are important and very much needed to be pondered, but what I'm speaking of is something quite different. It has to do with a fragment of our conversation that does stand out very clearly in my mind as I am now writing. It was well after we had finished our meal. Breaking one of the many long silences, I said to him, What I need to understand is, what is the heart of Christianity? There must be such a heart, an inner core, but I don't know through what avenues in myself I can begin to sense this inner nature of the teaching. I don't know what sort of uh, perceptions or impressions will give rise to the intuition of what Christianity is. I want to know what is the being of Christianity. To this he answered, also my question, that. Father Sylvan. Returning to America, I no longer had any temptation to write about Christianity. If before I had felt like an outsider in terms of my personal background, I now realize that all my conceptions about a possible hidden tradition of Christianity probably contained as much fantasy as reality. I mean to say that through meeting this man, I was more than ever convinced that such a tradition exists, but at the same time, I was equally convinced that access to this tradition was far more difficult than I had imagined even in terms of glimpsing its theoretical outlines, not to mention its practical methods and disciplines. I saw how naive it had been to think that a lost Christianity would become visible to me in the same way that the Asian religions were making themselves known to the modern world. One morning, nearly a year later, I arrived at my office at the university to find waiting for me a large battered package with Egyptian stamps on it. There was no return address. The outer wrapping had been torn and the whole thing secured with wire by the postal service. Pieces of string still hung loosely around the middle. I could see that it was a manuscript that had been damaged in transit, and my only thought was a hope that the poor author had not sent me his only copy. I set the package aside, and it did not open, and did not open it until uh, returning home late that night. When I did open it, I could not make at first what head or tail out of it. There was well over a thousand pages of handwritten manuscript, some of it water-soaked and torn. The script was very hard to decipher, and at first glance I was not even sure it was in the English language. The top sheet, which seemed to be some sort of covering letter, had been so water-soaked that it was a little more than a blur. Again, I set it aside, and after taking care of some other work, I went to bed. The following morning, before leaving for the university, I looked it over again. I was thunderstruck when I suddenly realized what it was. The script now seemed much more legible for some reason, and even the covering letter could be made out. Dis despite the smeared ink, it was only a few lines. It read, Dear Professor Needleman, Father Sylvan, who died one month ago, left these papers to be disposed of by being forwarded to you in Christ the Savior. No signature. I cannot describe the feelings 
that poured through me at that moment. In my chest there appeared a sensation of warmth which remained with me throughout the day. During the afternoon, I could think of nothing but that manuscript at home on my desk. My students thought I was ill. When I returned home, I closeted myself in my study and began reading. I intended to spend the whole night and the whole next day, if necessary, reading. I canceled all my appointments and informed the household that I was not to be disturbed for any reason. Oddly enough, the most persistent feeling I had was a sense of gratitude that now I knew the man's name, Father Sylvan. I expected that in these papers I would find out all the other facts about him that I wanted to know, his background, what monastic order he belonged to, uh, where it was situated, etc. But I must say now that no information of this sort was in the manuscript. My intention to go through the whole manuscript at one sitting was quickly abandoned. After only an hour's reading, I had to put it down. I could not come back to it until the following day, and again could only read a few pages before having to stop to digest the ideas it contained. Reading in this way, it took me over two months to go through the entire manuscript. When I was finished, I was convinced that I had in my hands a document that could revolutionize the modern understanding of the Christian religion. On the other hand, I knew that many of the ideas would be completely unacceptable to most people, as indeed many were to me. What to do? I selected what I considered to be the most striking and bold parts of the text, had them retyped on regular typewritten writer paper, and put the selections together in a paper folder. I then showed it to a colleague of mine, a biblical scholar with whom I had had some good conversations in the past. In order to account for the broken English grammar, I explained that the text was a literal translation of a treatise written by a Russian theologian that had been submitted to me for editing and publication in my metaphysical library series. I was not at all surprised when a week later my colleague returned the manuscript to me with a disdainful laugh. Frankly, he said, I was only able to read half of this nonsense. There is not a single substantiated claim in the whole package. The man is obviously just riding his own horse, which is taking him right to Never Never Land. Another colleague, also a New Testament scholar, reacted in a similar way. To him it was all just warmed over Gnosticism with a dash of pseudo-mystical allegoracing. He added, It's incredible that anyone calling himself a Christian theologian would so underplay the most distinctive feature of Christian theology, the historiosity of Christ. In any case, the man is totally ignorant of the latest methods of biblical criticism. Ah, I then made a new selection of material from the manuscript and had it typed up as before, after smoothing out the bad grammar. This time I tried to make the selection as representative as possible adding parts that were relatively straightforward and conventional, though there was nothing in the text that was entirely conventional, and including some of the lighter sections as well, in which Father Sylvan exhibited a somewhat pungent sense of humor. I also included sections that read like a travel journal. He had apparently investigated many cultures throughout the world, not as a missionary, but as a participant. Once again, I showed it to friends and colleagues, telling them a similar fictitious story about the author. Responses were much more positive, but equally discouraging to me. Everyone enjoyed what Father Sylvan said about life and completely ignored what he said about, said about Christianity. An old friend suggested that I had invented Father Sylvan. Now I am here, wondering what to do, really. On one side are these hundreds of pages of writings that, in any case, touch me very deeply. And they are about Christianity, or are they? Are all the critics right? Could it be that the sort of fire these ideas generate in me has nothing to do really with Christianity, after all? And are Christians who are looking for the practical, mystical core of Western tradition actually looking for something that does not interest me? I see that the question of a lost Christianity is a question about myself. It is an extraordinary notion. On the one hand, there is what millions of people for hundreds of years have been saying about Christianity. 
On the other side is this sense of search that I personally feel with respect to what I understand of Western religious ideas together at the moment with this peculiar ma manuscript that touches me so deeply. It is no longer simply a question of whether this manuscript is accurate or not, right or not, authentic or not. It is not a question of my presuming to say something about a subject upon which I am not entitled to speak. It is myself that is in question, my own sense of what I am, what I need to know in order to begin living.